is fearlessly faithful. As we look at the Church of Smyrna, we'll see something interesting that we haven't seen before. Uh, well, not last week, uh, and uh, that we'll only see twice through the seven churches as we go through these seven churches and continue on through the book of Revelation. And that is a church that has no rebuke from the Lord, but only commendation and encouragement. And so the theme for today is fearlessly faithful, because that is what the Lord wants them to remain and what the Lord wants also for the rest of us to be, that we would be fearlessly faithful. And so before we get started, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for this time that we can study your word. And we pray that you would just be with us, fill us up with your Holy Spirit, give us understanding into your word. Lord, not, not only that it might academically mean something to us, but Lord, that, that it would touch our hearts, it would touch our souls, that we would desire to live the way you would want us to live, Lord, especially as we look at this passage, that we would be fearlessly faithful. We thank you, Lord. We love you. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's read verses 8 through 11, and we'll start off with Atikarm. Verse 8, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten times. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. The first shall not be heard by the second death, the compromising church. Oh, we'll, we'll just stop there. So as we see in this passage, this is the letter written to the Church of Smyrna. Last week, of course, was the Church of Ephesus with Pastor Jimmy. Do you guys remember what the issue was with the church in Ephesus? Love, lost their first love. They, they left their, forgot, left their first love. They, I uh, know, had become... Apathetic. Sometimes they think the opposite of love is hate, but really the opposite of love is apathy, which is lack of love, <laughs> obvious. Uh, and that's sometimes even worse. Uh, just being apathetic, just being like, well, well, it doesn't matter, you know. And continuing on and doing the things that you're doing, but not really doing it out of a place of love, especially as Christians doing the ministry. And that can happen so easily, no? And that was last week. We looked at that last week, how we need to be passionate for the Lord. We need to be in love with the Lord. It's not just about the works we do, but it's about the relationship we have with the Lord. This week, we're looking at a church that is faithful and has no rebuke from the Lord, no condemnation from the Lord, only good things to say, but they're a church that is going to uh, that is in a tough situation and is going to be going through an even tougher situation. And so as we look through this one, we see first, as always, the image of Jesus. So, so the first thing in all of these churches is Jesus gives a picture of himself. And each one is tailored to their specific circumstance. And so here we see what is the picture of Jesus in the second half of verse 8. <clears throat> So first of all, first and the last, right? Now, what's the significance of the phrase first and last? Think about that. What's significance about Jesus being the first and the last? And think especially about their situation. Their lives are very difficult. What's the significance of Jesus being the first and the last? He doesn't just say it randomly. It's it's fit for their situation. Always was and always will be. And think about that in contrast to their problems. Will their problems be eternal? No. But we have a Lord who is eternal. He was before all of our problems and He will exist long after all of our problems. He is the one that we can eternally come to for help. 
You know, our problems, sometimes they're here, sometimes they're not. If you can think through your life so far, some parts of your life have been easier than others. Maybe, you know, it depends on our situation, but sometimes our, we have a lot of difficulties and sometimes the difficulties come and go or different types of difficulties. But what remains the same throughout all those things? The Lord is still there. The Lord Jesus Christ is still there. And He helps us in all of our circumstances. All the things that we need help in, He is always there because He is the first and the last. He's always existent. So if you need help, you can go to the one who has always existed. So that's the way he pictures himself to this church in Smyrna that is going through very difficult times. Now how else does he describe himself? What's the second description there? There's two descriptions. What's the second one? He was dead and now he's alive, which is referring to his resurrection, right? So he is the resurrected one. Now as we go through this path, you know, I, I can just imagine the church at Smyrna. They get this letter and it's being read to them. You know, maybe all the other letters also brought to the churches and they know uh, each one is tailored specifically. And they start to hear this letter and they're like, uh-oh. I am the one who is dead and now is alive. Oh, what does that mean? He's talking about death. <laughs> because we know the church in Smyrna is going to have to face death. And this is fit to their situation because it doesn't matter if they're going to die. We serve the one who was dead and came back to life. Is death final as the world around us would say it is? You know, you have people spending uh, millions and millions of dollars to have themselves cryogenically frozen. Have you ever heard of that before? I think I mentioned that before. People will cryogenically freeze their bodies. We don't know how to, the, the scientists don't know how to unfreeze people yet, but they know how to freeze them. So it's kind of like a one-way trip unless technology changes later on. And that's what they're hoping for. They're hoping for, and maybe they have, you know, terminal cancer, or maybe they have some kind of, uh, sickness or disease that can't be cured and they know they're going to die and so they have themselves frozen in the hopes that someday in the future not number one scientists will be able to unfreeze them number two cure their disease because people fear death so much this world fears death like nothing else we saw that with the coronavirus pandemic <laughs> how many Things were completely locked down. Children's schools were locked down because parents were afraid that the kids would pass the coronavirus and then they would get sick and die. Not to say that there weren't people that did suffer during coronavirus. Of course there were. But it wasn't as they said it was. It wasn't crazy like they said it was. It was bad, but it wasn't all they made it out to be. But the reason why it happened, why we were, we were forced to wear face shields and face masks and all these things, was because of the fear of death. But Jesus wants the church of Smyrna to know, before he tells them what they're going to have to face, because they're going to have to face death, he wants them to know first, before all of that, that he is the one who was dead and is now alive. Is death final for us who are Christians? Is death final for us who are, are Christians? Three, two, one. No. No, good. <laughs> death is not final for us who are Christians. It's not something that we have to live in fear of as if, oh, that's it, that's the old, you know, that's it, that's gone, I'm gone after that. No. Of course, is, is death pleasant? No, of course not. It's not pleasant. Who wants to die? Especially some of the ways that you could die. I used to, my greatest fear used to be like uh, drowning death. You know, <laughs> you're in the ocean out there like we were with Pastor Jimmy snorkeling and then, you know, you, somehow you get a cramp or something and then, I know, die because you drowned. Well, that's, it, it, that could happen. It could happen. <laughs> But all the, uh, no, all of it teachers and John Paul, you didn't let that stop you, right? You went snorkeling anyways. Good job, guys. 
We all have a fear of death, and death is sometimes, and, and most of the time, it's not pleasant. Maybe some people will die in their sleep. Hey, that's great, you know. That's uh, good for them. I'm glad, I'm glad that happened that way. Some people will suffer and have a difficult time and even be tortured to death, as we see as a possibility for the church in Smyrna. But what does it matter? In the long run, what does it matter? Even if we were to be tortured for the sake of Christ, killed for our faith, mercilessly and ruthlessly, what does it actually matter? We serve the one who was dead and came back to life. Now we're not talking about uh, present resurrection here. Of course the Lord could do that as well, and He has done that throughout the ages many times. But we know someday we will be resurrected back to life and we will be with Christ ruling and reigning on this earth. Not, not to get revenge, obviously. But we will be ruling and reigning on this earth with Jesus Christ one day in our resurrected form. So what if we die right now? Now, the truth is, 100% certainty, Micah, you will die. Unless Jesus comes back first. Same with Chris Jane, same with Heidi, same with Addie, same with all of us. We will die someday unless Jesus Christ comes back first and raptures us. Unless then, we will all die. Some of us sooner, some of us later. I don't want to die particularly because I don't want to leave my wife and kids alone, you know. I would, uh, well, you know, I'd be in heaven, but, but I, would, I wouldn't want them to be alone. Although, of course, I know the Lord would take care of them if ever something like that should happen. If no one wants to die, like experience the, the, the uh, experience of death, but we should all recognize that it is nothing in the grand scheme of things. And in fact, actually, the only thing that death does for us as believers is send us into the presence of our Lord. That's the only thing that it does for us as believers. It sends us into the presence of our Lord. And so we see the description of Jesus Christ being the one who has died and came to life. He has, he, he's not only the first and the last, he's beyond all our problems. And so we can come to him and trust him as, as the one who is before our problems and the one who will be after our problems, the one who will carry us through all our trials and tribulations, and the one who even can resurrect us if we should die. And of course, that might be required of some of us. We will all die, but some of us might be required to die for our faith. You never know. You know, I'm sure there were times, being missionaries, that you wondered if uh, your life was going to be forfeit for the sake of the gospel when you're out sharing the gospel. I've been reading missionary biographies to my children, one called Bruchko, in which he, he wanted to go to this uh, very uh, warrior-like tribe in the Amazon jungles, deep in the Amazon jungles. And the first time he encountered them, he didn't even see them, but their arrows saw him. And he got shot in the hip, and then they captured him, and let his wound fester for a month in one of their huts, as he was, you know, sick and vomiting, and, and no one was taking care of him. Finally, the Lord allowed him to escape, and then you know what he did? He got healed up, and he went right back. <laughs> he, he went right back and they were like looking at him when he got to their village again uh, you know it's like a year later like what are you doing back here like we tried to kill you like well, what is this guy doing and then they laughed about it and welcomed him, in, <laughs> him into the drive <laughs> it was hilarious you know and you read about it in the book he didn't fear death missionaries if you have to go out you, you have to be fearless who knows if the Lord is calling one of us to do something in some other place who knows We serve the Lord who was dead and came to life. So we see first the vision of who Jesus is. He's preeminently eternal and resurrected. He's beyond all of our problems. The one we can trust to is the anchor outside of our problems. And he is the one who is resurrected back to life. So if, he, if we would die, well, what does it matter? Now we see the commendation or the, the uh, encouragement that what they're doing is right. Uh, not condemnation, commendation, like, hey, you're doing this great. 
And the commendation for them is that they're persevering even in hardship and persecution. Look at what it says in verse 9. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. So three things we see about them. Number one, their works. Even though they have much difficulty, they're still ministering for the Lord, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. They haven't given up and said, oh, this is, you know, this is hopeless, I'm getting persecuted for my faith, I might as well just give up. They didn't say that. No, they kept persevering for the sake of Jesus Christ. Number two, their tribulation. Obviously, even at this time, they're having difficulties. Now, it's not specific here whether this was just normal tribulations or whether this was persecution, but it could have been either one, maybe both, that they were going through difficulties in their life. Not only that, but their poverty. Obviously, this was a church that was very poor. In contrast to the church of Laodicea, which we'll see at the end of chapter 3, which was a very rich church, and yet at the same time a very... Um, a very loveless church, a very apathetic church as well. They were lukewarm, as it says there in the text. But unlike them, this church is a poor church. This church is a church that doesn't have anything. But Jesus says, I know your poverty, but you are rich. You know, it's interesting to, to think about, you know, the Lord always describes those who are poor physically as being rich spiritually. The idea is, is that just because you don't have physical riches doesn't mean that you're poor. It just means that you can have a different type of riches. Oftentimes the problem with people who are too wealthy, not always, but oftentimes, is that they get so possessed by their possessions that they don't focus on spiritual things. But of course, when you're poor, what do you always need to do? Lord, please give me food for next week. Lord, please help me in this situation. Lord, I don't have money for rent. Please help me. Give me something so that I might survive, so that I might subsist. When you're poor and a Christian, your dependence is on the Lord because your dependence can't be on anything else. When you're rich, oftentimes, not always, oftentimes, our, your dependence is not on the Lord, it's on what you already have. And so your spiritual life is in poverty while your physical life has riches. But for those who are Christians, strong Christians, and are poor physically, they have great spiritual riches because of their relationship with the Lord needs to be strong. And so they have three things going for them. They have their works, they have their tribulation, they have their poverty, and, and in all of these things they have not given up. That's really the great thing here. In all of these things that they have not given up. The Lord sees all these issues and they have not given up in any of these things. And then additionally, we see something from those who are outside of them, the persecution against them. It says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not but are a synagogue of Satan. Now during this time, a lot of the persecution came from the Jews. From the time of Paul all the way until now, there was a lot of persecution from the Jews. Now, the Bible in uh, the book of Romans in chapter 11 of Romans says that the Jews are our enemies for the sake of the gospel. Not that we count them, well, we count them as enemies and what do you do with an enemy? As a Christian, you pray for them and you share the gospel. So, <laughs> there are enemies concerning the gospel because Jews haven't received the gospel yet. But for the sake of the fathers, they're beloved because God still has a plan for them in the future. Now, it doesn't mean that those who are right now who haven't accepted Jesus are going to be saved. They're not. But someday, the whole nation will be saved, all those who remain at that time. But for now, and during that time especially, the Jews were very much persecutors of Christians because they felt, rightly or you know, obviously wrongly, but, but in their heart they were convinced of this, that the Jews, that the Christians were a, a blasphemous sect. They thought, you know, they have a different God, Jesus. Of course, they didn't realize the scriptures, what the scriptures say about the Messiah, that he would truly be God. They didn't realize those things. And so they persecuted the Christians. And this church was obviously persecuted by the Jews who were there in Smyrna. 
they considered themselves to be of God, but uh, here the Lord says they're actually a synagogue of Satan. They're not truly God's people anymore. They're a synagogue of Satan. Sad to say. And so this church was enduring lots of hardships. Hardships from poverty. Hardships from persecution. Hardships from tribulation. Yet at the same time, they're still working for the Lord Jesus Christ. They're still ministering no matter what. What a wonderful church. Is encountering so many difficulties and still pressing on no matter what. Now, in verse 10, we get the exhortation. And the way I would summarize the exhortation is that they should be fearlessly faithful even till death. In verse 10 it says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. The Lord's telling them they're going to suffer something soon. He doesn't say exactly when they're going to suffer it, but something soon they're going to have to suffer through. And he says, do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. You know, it is the tendency, especially if we know what's coming, that we would be filled with fear. Have you ever had some situation coming up and you know it's going to be difficult? Instantly, automatically, there's that fear in our hearts, in our minds. Of course, what are we supposed to do with our fears, our trials, our troubles, our burdens? What are we supposed to do with those things? Jesus. Trust in Jesus. We had the devotion yesterday with Marcel, Marcel, and uh, he quoted from Philippians where we should be not anxious for anything but casting our cares before the Lord and of course knowing that the Lord, He cares for us. We take our burdens, we take our trials, we take our tribulations to the Lord. If we were to, everybody gets fear. Right? I don't think anybody could say here that they've never been afraid of anything or are not afraid of anything, maybe even at the present time. Maybe you've got that bill coming up and you're saying, how am I going to pay this? And that's a thing of fear. Maybe you've got this situation coming up and you say, how am I going to get through this situation? That's a thing of fear. It could be feared. And instead, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to take our burdens and cares to the Lord and give them over to Him. So he says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. So we see in their specific circumstance, they're going to endure persecution. Now in this case, it wouldn't just be from the Jews. Maybe we don't know exactly what happened. There's no records in history of this, at least not any specific records. It's just a smaller event. The Lord's speaking to this specifically to this church. It's a, a small event, but it was big for them. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison. So they're going to come up to a very, very difficult situation soon. Probably persecution from the Romans, not just the Jews, because the Jews didn't control the prisons in Smyrna. That would be the Romans. And so they're going to have some form of persecution from the governmental authorities who are then going to throw them into prison. Now what is the purpose for this being thrown into prison? Now this is a trick question. Anything you answer, dude, there's two things, there's two right answers. So I'll count it as long as you get one of them. What's the, uh, what's the purpose that we see here in the passage for which they are going to be thrown into prison? Look at the text. What does it say there? That what? For what purpose? That you may be tested. Hmm. Tested by who? Now this word, that's why it's a trick question. I don't think it's a trick question. This word <coughs> in the Greek is translated either tested or tempted. In fact, you can see this in the book of James chapter 1 that it's sometimes translated as tempted, the Greek word behind this one, and sometimes translated as tested, because depending on who's doing it, it's either temptation or testing. If Satan is bringing something against us, it's a temptation, because what? He wants us to sin. But when the Lord allows this to happen, because the Lord is allowing the devil to throw them into prison, the Lord could say, no, I'm not going to allow that, just like he put a boundary around Job. He could have said, I'm not going to allow that, but the Lord's allowing it. For what purpose? 
The devil wants to tempt us so that we might sin. The Lord wants to test us so that our righteousness would be proved out. Of course, we see at the beginning of, of, of the book of James and, and other places as well that when our faith is tested, it produces patience in James. And then also we see in Peter that when our faith is, is tested in the fire, it's like it's refining gold, pure gold, getting rid of all the impurities in our life. The devil has a purpose for sure. He wants to tempt us to sin. But the Lord has a purpose for sure as well in allowing this thing. He wants to test us, to prove us, and to get rid of all the impurities from our life. And sometimes there's nothing like a little trial or tribulation to really help purify us. You know, someone, I, I think it was Pastor John Michaels who founded this, because I, you know, I grew up in his church listening to his sermons, so I, a lot of my illustrations I think are from him <laughs> before. He used to say that when you're in a trial, you get squeezed like toothpaste. Once, once the toothpaste is squeezed, you can't put it back in. You see what's inside of it, right? You, you know, toothpaste bottle, you can't see what's inside of it until you squeeze it. Most of them aren't, you know, most of them aren't clear, right? And for our lives, sometimes we need to be squeezed for us to see what's inside of our lives. And then we can say, ooh, that's not something that's good. And then the Lord can help us change those things that are inside of our lives. When we're tested, what's inside of us gets squeezed out. And now we can start having the Lord refine our life. What was that? You know, sometimes we get in a situation, we get squeezed and... Something not good comes out. We have, a, you know, anger or, you know, some cuts us off in the traffic or worse, you know, like we have this... Uh, actually, I need to apologize because I think I wasn't reacting rightly about the mask thing. You know, the mask thing, I think I got too angry about that. And I should have been more uh, calm about, about that. And um, <laughs> I got squeezed a little bit and came out and I'm like, ooh, I don't think what came out was very good. <laughs> That's what trials and tribulations do for us. They test us. They allow what's inside to be shown so that we can be proved forth. And so here also the church at Smyrna is going to, some of them are going to be thrown into prison that they may be tested. And how long will their tribulation be? Ten days. So they'll have 10 days of tribulation, which uh, when you're going through difficult times, it can be an eternity. 10 days is, is quite a bit of time. Now what's the Lord's command there at the end of verse 10? Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Remember who we're serving. He's the first and the last. He's the eternally existent one. He's the one who died and rose from, the death, rose from the dead. He is the one who gives life. If you die for His sake, can He give you life? Absolutely. When we die, someday we will be resurrected back to life. And if we die for Him, of course, He's going to give us the crown of life. He's going to give us everlasting life. Not just a physical resurrection here on this earth, but an eternal one in a new body, in a new form, so that we can live eternally with Him. Now, we don't know the specifics of this particular time in the church in, in, in Smyrna. We don't know who got thrown into prison. We don't know what the you know, outcome of that was. But I do believe that this message of the Lord to the church at Smyrna had a great effect upon the church of Smyrna. And the reason why I think that is because in church history, about 50 years later, there arose another great persecution against the church in, in, in all across the Roman areas, and specifically in Smyrna, where the, the bishop, they're called bishops at that time, the bishop of Smyrna, a guy named Polycarp, was martyred for his faith. I think I've mentioned that before, but I actually want to read a short snippet of his, what's called the martyrdom of Polycarp. Now, it may be a few things in here are kind of like exaggerated. We don't know for sure. It's not Bible account. This is not a Bible account. This is a historical account that may have some um, 
enhancements, we'll say. Maybe there's certain parts of it that are enhanced, but, but most of it, I think, is exactly accurate, especially his words as conveyed by those who are witnessing, the Christians who are witnessing. And so, let me just read from the time when he was brought into the arena, or the Colosseum, to be tried for his faith. And so this is just, just short. Arena. There came a voice from heaven. Be brave, Polycarp, and act like a man. No one saw the speaker, but our people who were present heard the voice. Finally, when he was brought forward, the proconsul, Romans, the Roman proconsul, asked him if he were Polycarp. When he admitted it, he tried to persuade him to a denial of the faith, saying, Have regard for your age, and other suggestions as they usually make. Swear by the genius of Caesar, change your mind, say, away with the atheists. At that point, they felt that Christians were the atheists, because we only believe in one God, whereas the Romans and the Greeks before them believe in a bunch of different gods. So they called Christians atheists. It's kind of funny, but Christians were called the atheists because we only have one God. And so he was commanding him, say, away with the atheists, which would have been the Christians in their mind. Then Polycarp, with solemn countenance, gazed on the whole crowd of lawless pagans in the stadium, waved his hand at them, groaned and looked up at heaven and said, away with the atheists, <laughs> because these are the ones who really don't believe in the true God, the, the ones in the crowd. As the proconsul urged him and said, take the oath and I, and I release you. Revile Christ. That was as simple as it was. He would be set free. All he has to do is curse Christ and then they would set him free. Probably two words. Just curse Christ and you can go free. Can you imagine? If someone's not a strong Christian, if they're a lukewarm Christian, maybe they're going to think, well, you know what? It's my life, so I better just do that. The Lord will understand, right? Hmm. <coughs> Polycarp said, 86 years I have served him, Jesus, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? As he further insisted and said, Swear by the genius of Caesar, or fortune of Caesar, Polycarp replied, If you vainly imagine that I will swear by the genius of Caesar, as you say, and pretend not to know who I am, let me tell you plainly, I am a Christian. But if you desire to learn the teachings of Christianity, grant a day and a hearing. The proconsul said, Persuade the people. But Polycarp said, So far as you are concerned, I should have judged you to be worthy of discussion. For we have been taught to give honor, as is proper, to rulers and authorities appointed by God, provided it does not harm us. But I do not esteem these people worthy of making a defense before them. The proconsul said, I have wild animals. To them I will throw you, unless you change your mind. But he said, call them. For change of mind from better to worse is a change not allowed to us. But it is good to change from wickedness to justice. Again he said to him, if you scorn the wild beasts, I will have you burned by fire, unless you repent. But Polycarp said, You threaten the fire that burns for an hour, and in a little while is quenched. For you do not know the fire of future judgment and of eternal punishment, the fire reserved for the wicked. But why do you delay? Come do as you wish. <laughs> why are you delaying? Come do it. Stop threatening me. Bring the beast, bring the fire, do it. This is an 86 year old, uh, but maybe almost 90 year old guy standing in the middle of the arena with all these raging crowds gnashing their teeth at him. The threat of wild beasts, the threat of being burned at the fire. And he says, what is, what, do it. Who cares? Because we know that a fire for a few minutes is nothing compared to the eternal flames of hellfire. Why would we sacrifice eternal bliss with the Lord for a few more years on this earth if persecution should arise? Now I put it to you. Someday persecution may come to us. You never know. We, before we had the threats of the Sogi bill, 
And that one literally said that if you are not giving in to the demands of the LGBT community, then you could be thrown in prison. Uh, it said uh, if, you, if you run a school and you don't allow someone into your school based on LGBTQ status, I mean, you say, I say, well, that doesn't, go, that goes against our honor code. Then the punishment in that law is 10 years in jail. Pretty crazy. Now, for now, it seems like that bill's been stopped, but the devil doesn't stop. He just keeps working other avenues. In the States right now, I just read something two days ago where there was... Uh, there was a bunch of Christians that were sentenced, uh, that were not, that were um, found guilty, quote unquote, of breaking a law called, it's called the FACE Act or something like that, where supposedly you're not allowed to protest outside abortion clinics or other things like that. These Christians were outside an abortion clinic, not right next to it, but outside of it somewhere, and they were, they were trying to talk to the people that were going to get an abortion, to the women. Not, not being vicious towards them, but being loving towards them and saying, hey, do you need help? We can get help for you. We can help you so that you don't have to, to, to kill your baby. These people were arrested and found guilty of breaking this terrible, terrible law that was created. And now they could be sentenced to up to 11 years in jail. 11 years in jail for sharing the love of Jesus with somebody. They weren't being vicious. They weren't being angry. They weren't being hateful. They were sharing the love of Jesus with somebody and they could be put in jail for 11 years. In Canada, there's already people who have been put in jail. Do we think that it can't happen here? Well, I pray it never happens here. I pray it doesn't happen here, that there wouldn't be anything that would be a law made against Christians. I pray that it doesn't happen. But what if it did? The worst, the worst cases in church history have been when the church did not expect persecution and then persecution arose suddenly and they weren't prepared for it. And so we need to always be prepared. We're not yet the church at Smyrna. We're not yet the church that's faced with persecution right now. There are many today that are. The church in Iran, the church in North Korea, the, the church in China, uh, other places around the world where they're persecuted for their faith and even killed for their faith. We're not yet the church in Smyrna. But what if that would become our circumstance? How Do we have it set in our hearts, as it says here in the text, to be faithful until death? Do we have that set in our hearts that we would be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ even until death? I pray and I hope that we would. May we be fearlessly faithful.